Now let's get to judicial review. Marbury v. Madison. At Jefferson's inauguration in March 1801, he tried to conciliate or make amends with his Federalist opponents by claiming that both parties shared his, the same principles, even if they disagreed in their opinions. In reality, they had totally different views of the, the, the route government should take. Hamiltonian, remember, was industrial, urban, uh, manufacturing. Jefferson was independent Yankee farmer, more rural. So Jefferson vowed to reduce government, free trade, uh, and to, to ensure free trade, and to ensure freedom of religion and the press, and avoid, quote, entangling alliances with other nations. He sought to dismantle much of the Federalist edifice, their platform, what they created under Washington and Adams, and prevent the kind of centralized state Federalists promoted and that Anti-Federalists were afraid of upon the ratification of the Constitution. He pardoned those jailed under the Sedition Act. He reduced the Army and Navy and the number of government employees. He abolished all taxes except for the tariff, and he paid off part of the nation's debt. Effectively, Jefferson tried to roll back almost everything they had done by everything the Federalists had done by cutting taxes and the size of the government. He also, by the way, let the first national bank fade away. It had to Please excuse the interruption. I have some exciting news from the athletic department to share. Sorry about that. So before I was so rudely interrupted, uh, Jefferson let the national bank uh, fade away. It had to be renewed, and he just let it fade away. Didn't didn't allow it to be renewed. So, <coughs> excuse me, reading from the second paragraph in the notes here. Despite Jefferson's wishes, the Supreme Court under Chief Justice John Marshall, a Federalist and Adams appointee, increased its power during his administration. In a very famous Supreme Court case, Marbury v. Madison, 1803, the Marshall Court established the right of the Supreme Court to determine whether an act of Congress violates the Constitution, the power known as the ju uh, Judicial Review. The Marshall Court also soon established the right of the nation's highest court to determine the constitutionality of state laws. So here's the thing. Jefferson, right before Adams left office, he appointed a whole bunch of judges to federal courts. They were called the Midnight Judges. And upon Jefferson taking office, he wanted uh, to get rid of as many of those Federalist judges as he could. And he did get rid of some of them. Uh, they were misbehaving. But one in particular, uh, in other words, for some of the judges, he tried to block them from taking their appointment by not issuing them their letter of, of employment, so to speak. Okay, their commission. Uh, and Madison was supposed to give it to the judges. Okay? Uh, it was in Jefferson's cabinet. Madison didn't give the... Madison was ordered by Jefferson to not give the letter of commission, the letter of employment, and Marbury eventually sued to get that letter. Now, there was a Federal Judicial Act on the books that stated that the president had to give that letter over to Marbury. But here's the thing. Jefferson and Justice John Marshall, they were cousins. They hated each other. Jefferson's famous for saying something like, if he ever asks you a question, don't answer. For example, if he asks you if the sky is blue, if you think the sky is blue, don't answer, because he'll have you convinced it's purple. Something like that. So they didn't like each other. So Marshall says, you know what, Jefferson? You're right. I don't, I can't make you give him that letter. So on the surface, it appears Jefferson wins this, this whole, whole thing. But here's, here's the thing. Marshall says, you know why I can't make you? Because that, con that congressional act, that congressional act, that judiciary act that says that you must do it is unconstitutional. So what did Marshall just do? He grabbed the power of judicial review for the Supreme Court. All right, we're almost done. Moving on. The next thing we will talk about is the Louisiana Purchase. And this is a picture of New Orleans at the base of the Mississippi River in 1803. Beautiful. All right. Jefferson saw the Louisiana Purchase as his greatest achievement. You'll see a map on the next slide. And yet his view was highly ironic given its origins and character. Acquired by France in 1800, 
the vast Louisiana Territory, stretching from the Mississippi to the Rocky Mountains, was purchased by uh, Jefferson for the very small sum of $15 million. But it was sold only because the Haitian Revolution, <coughs> which Jefferson detested, had defeated an overtaxed French military, and Napoleon needed funds for campaigns in Europe. So, the slaves defeated the French in Haiti, kicked them out. Napoleon said, ah, forget this whole New World Empire thing. I need money for my wars in Europe. So he sold, desperately sold, Louisiana to Jefferson. All right, so a revolution that terrified Jefferson benefited him greatly in the Louisiana Purchase uh, because the revolution helped lead to the purchase. Americans were happy to, to secure the Port of New Orleans, thus ensuring a previously precarious right to freely trade on the Mississippi. In other words, who controlled New Orleans was, uh, was debatable before this. Though Jefferson doubled the nation's size and ended France's presence in North America, the Federalists, now who are out of power, opposed the purchase as wasteful. Jefferson believed Louisiana ensured the survival of the agrarian republic of small and independent virtuous farmers. So if you look at this slide here, that's not what I meant to click. Jefferson thought this whole area here was going to basically become an empire for liberty. He, in fact, wanted to give the land away to potential independent Yankee farmers. So he thought it would ensure his vision of Republican agrarianism. Also, these people would vote for him because they'd be getting this land in large part. Also, Jefferson, I'm reading from the notes here, a strict constructionist, also acknowledged that the Constitution nowhere gave the president the right to take this kind of action without approval from Congress. So a man who was a strict constructionist was loosely interpreting his own powers while he was in the Oval Office. A little hypocrisy there. Whoa, I went too far. All right, looking at the notes. Soon after purchasing Louisiana, Jefferson dispatched two fellow Virginians, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, gotta buy Sacagawea to explore it, and you can see their route leaving from St. Louis and winding up in the state of Washington. They were to conduct scientific and commercial surveys in order to find ways to exploit the region's resources. In other words, better enable us to expand. Also to develop trade with Indians and find a commercial route to the Pacific Ocean that could foster or help create trade with Asia. In two years, Lewis and Clark traveled all the way to the Pacific, reaching it in the area of today's, oh, sorry, Oregon, and back. Though they did not find a commercial route to Asia, their success reinforced the belief that America's territory would one day extend to the Pacific Ocean. Manifest destiny, here we come. In other words, they provided invaluable information to the U.S. that would pave the way for westward expansion and the destruction of the natives. So, ironically, natives who had never really encountered English white before uh, helped in their own destruction by helping out Lewis and Clark. Incorporating Louisiana, especially New Orleans, was not easy. It had multiple legal and cultural traditions begun there by the Spanish and French. Slaves in New Orleans under these regimes did have some limited rights. Slave women, for example, under Spanish rule, had the right to go to court for protection against cruelty or rape by their owners. But even though the treaty said the U.S. would recognize all previous rights and legal customs, the rights of slaves and blacks were severely circumscribed once the U.S. took over. So they wound up with less rights. Some empire of liberty, huh? The Louisiana Purchase show that despite being far removed from Europe, events across the Atlantic world deeply affected the U.S. Because the U.S. depended on many goods, especially manufactured goods from Europe, the wars there directly influenced Americans' livelihoods. Jefferson hoped to avoid becoming entangled in Europe's wars, but ultimately he could not ignore these struggles. We were becoming a global world. Jefferson, who wanted a diminished central state, used the military to fight the nation's first war against pirates, a war to protect commerce in the Mediterranean. In North Africa, the Barbary states had long preyed on European and U.S. shipping, north of Africa, south of Europe. Although they refrained from attacking ships if a nation paid a hefty tribute, which English, England had always paid for the colonies. When Jefferson refused demands that the U.S. increase its tribute, a war between the Barbary states and the U.S. started. 
lasting until 1804. The treaty ending the war ensured the freedom to ship freely in the Mediterranean and nearby Atlantic oceans. When war between France and Britain resumed in 1803, each nation imposed a blockade to deny the other's trade with the U.S., which was officially neutral. The British also engaged in the impressment of American sailors, essentially kidnapping them for service in the Royal Navy. Jefferson, believing America's economy required free trade open seas, enacted an embargo, basically prohibiting all American vessels from sailing to foreign ports to force an end to the blockades. Basically, he was shutting off international trade. He was closing off the U.S. from the rest of the world. Basically, it was a national boycott. He was going back to revolutionary-era tactics. But this time it didn't work, because we were so global. It hurt us more than them. The embargo stopped almost all American exports and devastated the nation's ports, manufacturers, and merchants, but did not persuade France or Great Britain to end the blockades. The embargo had led to an economic depression. Also, anathema to Jefferson's professed distrust, meaning opposite to what he usually thinks, uh, opposite to his usual distrust and fear of a strong central government, the embargo, remember, stopped all American vessels from sailing to foreign ports, which is an amazing use of federal power, which you think wouldn't be something Jefferson would do. That's the anathema part. Especially by a president supposedly dedicated to a weak central government. So in 1909, because it was so unsuccessful, the embargo that is, Jefferson signed the Non-Intercourse Act, which banned trade only with Britain and France, and promised a resumption of trade with either nation if it ended its ban on American shipping. And that's where we will end. We will pick up next unit. These events will help lead us into the War of 1812. So don't forget to take the quiz that will pop up right now.